Hello and welcome to News Click. Today, we are going to discuss the implications of the news that a number of Indian activists were among the people targeted by Pegasus, a spying software developed by an Israeli company. The news came out after WhatsApp told the Indian Express that at least two dozen activists were among the 1,400 people targeted by this software. A number of lawyers and activists have also come out and told the media that they got messages from WhatsApp and another organization telling them that they were being targeted. To talk more about this, we have with us Prabir Purkayastha. Hello, Prabir. Prabir, so could you first start by telling us what exactly is Pegasus and how does it work and how can it be used to target people, especially on WhatsApp since it's a safe software? Well, a lot of people have used WhatsApp in the belief that it is end-to-end -end encrypted and therefore it is safe. Now we know that 24 people at least in India were targeted and who targeted them is a question we need to return right. to. And the total number targeted in the world is about 1,400 or so, as you have said. And one of them is supposed to be Khashoggi, yeah. who was targeted obviously by Saudi Arabia, who had bought the software from Israel. Right. Now, of course, in this case also, Israel has sold the software to Indian government because they claim they sell it only to government agencies because the targets that have been revealed to have been uh, considered, I mean, who have been really targeted, are people who obviously were targeted by the government of India. They're involved in the Bhima Koregao case, charging Maoists for trying to infiltrate and create various things, uh, activist Bela Bhatia in the Chhattisgarh. So if we look at the profile of these people, these are also exactly the people who are sought to be targeted in different ways by the government, particularly before the elections. So this is clearly something we need to now seriously consider, that the governments along with agencies of the Israeli government are selling software which, are, which is really weaponized software. You asked, what is Pegasus? What does it do? Now, Pegasus is a is a weaponized software in the sense it is used to penetrate the devices of the people. So it is not something which penetrates WhatsApp. That is not what happens. What it does is if you actually use the phone to which it has either given missed calls or it has invited you to some group call or you have got a video message which you have tried to open, all of these apparently plant malware in your cell phone, in your smartphone, and that in turn compromises the device itself. Once it does that, then it has the ability to send everything you have on that phone to an external node, which is then run by the uh, company which is, or the institution or the agency which has bought the software from the Israeli company. Now, this is how the, uh, the devices get compromised. So it's not that WhatsApp encryption is broken, but since anyway your device knows what you have written, what your contacts are, none of this are actually encrypted on your phone. Therefore, what it means is that entire information you have in the phone can be taken out. And this is exactly what happens. So this kind of weaponized software are actually embargoed in different ways. There have been a lot of discussions in international bodies that cyber weapons should not be used or should be banned. Nation states should not be doing it. Unfortunately, the United States has been in the forefront of arguing that cyber weapons are difficult to ban for various reasons and they will not enter into any discussions and negotiations of banning cyber weapons, saying because it is difficult, therefore we don't think it's, we should be banning it. Right. But privately their position has been that we have an edge in cyber war over others and we should not compromise that. If you remember the nuclear weapons, this is exactly what the US had argued, that we have an edge on nuclear weapons and therefore we should not have a, a weapons ban, nuclear weapons ban, and it took about four years till the Soviet Union was also uh, secured the capability of nuclear weapons. So this is unfortunately a policy which only endangers the world much further. And the evidence of that is what we are seeing today. But let's also face facts that these are all, they also leak. All of these, whatever the government say, unfortunately all of this leak, and as you know, both the CIA and the NSA suit of 
malware for violating, shall we say, the phones and computers of uh, people have all been uh, now dumped in the, right. in the inter on the internet is openly available. Right. So what you have done is armed the whole number of people with mm -hmm. malware, weapons, cyber weapons effectively. Right. So a key point you mentioned is that uh, the software is sold only to state agencies or state actors. So the Indian government so far has refused to respond in any way to these accusations and charges. And WhatsApp has also filed a case in an Israeli court calling for the cancellation of NSO, the manufacturer of Pegasus, their export license. So there's been an argument raised, of course, that traditionally governments have always indulged in some form of surveillance. So qualitatively, what is the difference that this kind, the use of this kind of technology brings about? See, the one issue that comes up when you have a supposedly surveillance by the states, they are supposed to do it only under certain legal conditions. So both in the United States and in India, for example, there are supposedly laws which regulate what a state agency can do or cannot do. And if it has to create, it has to surveil its own citizens, what are the narrow grounds under which it can do so? Now, we also know that these are violated in actual practice because in the U in case of United States, there are the secret uh, FISA courts, which have allowed blanket surveillance, and we, that's now public after Snowden's disclosures. Nothing really has changed with all of that. Still, the FISA courts are completely opaque. What they allow government to do or not do, we do not know. We have known it for more than 10 years that uh, at and was allowing all the traffic to be accessed through its network to be accessed by NSA, which was verified when Snowden disclosures became public. And we also learned, so were the other telecom companies doing it. In Indian case, again, we now know that there is blanket clearance that the government has got, which is post facto signed as a bulk order by the secretary of the home, home department. And I think also the it also involves the telecom department in some way. But all of this means these are post facto signatures which allow for bulk surveillance. So bulk surveillance instead of targeted individual surveillance has become the de facto legal norm by either the FISA courts in the US or the way the Indian courts had given the instructions or the way government has implemented them. These are all public at the moment. Though government takes the usual position, they will neither confirm nor deny it. But as we know, we work this calculation out. I think a secretary has to sign something like uh, 1,700 individual orders a day if this is what is supposed to be done. And we know that uh, this is not being done in that way. Uh, this really bulk uh, clearance is taken with one signature and then, of course, lower down the line, people just pass it on. So given this, this is the era of bulk surveillance. So what's the difference between this and that? This is actually without any surveillance. This is not even going through the legal route that is there. This is basically hacking into somebody's phone. It is not even taking a legal permission of the kind we talked about, in which case you would do it through the exchange and you only look at the traffic. Right. Here you're hacking into the private property without a warrant, it's effectively carrying out a search on somebody's computer, extracting whatever you want out of it without any legal permission. It's equivalent to stealing, say, if my phone is hacked, it's equivalent to stealing my property. Now, government can has a legal right to seize property under certain conditions. Can it steal property? That's really the question because you are not monitoring traffic, which is what you do when you talked about surveillance. This is hacking into somebody's phone, goes qualitatively beyond that because you are trying to get my information, which I have stored believing it's my property, it's on my phone. And please understand, that for instance, my passwords for banks may be here. So if I, if that all of that is there, I could also keep secret documents over here. All of that is commercial value, and it has, of course, huge uh, safety issues for me 
because the kind of information I can keep on phone, if it falls not into government hands alone, it, don't forget it falls into the hands of the people who are running the government machinery. And as we know, even under NSA, people who are using it to see private, private messages, husbands and wives are sending, images of the, themselves, all of this was feast for the eye of the NSA people who are doing the surveillance. So this is the kind of uh, secret, sensitive, shall we say, absolutely, completely private, intimate information people will be storing on the phone, all of which can be then taken out by the government. And a government agency which is unaccountable with no legal uh, procedure whatsoever. And this is, as I said, seizure of uh, not only an invasion of privacy, a seizure of my property. Right. So, and this all is being done without any legal Freedom. sanction. Right. So, both the illegality of it, but illegality of not with respect to traffic, what I'm talking to you on a phone, but illegality of it because of you're seizing my private property without any order whatsoever. So, when an activist computer or phone is seized, it's seized under an order. Some legal document is given, he signs it and says, yes, I've handed over my computer, but this is none of that. So I think this goes far beyond anything which is legally permissible, either under Indian law or any other law. Right. So I think this is a very, very serious cause, cause for concern, and it is certainly not on par with surveillance. Right. And finally, you mentioned uh, the debates regarding some sort of an international framework on some of this kind of software. So according to you, what would be, say, the kind of uh, contours of such a framework which would actually effectively stop the use of such software? Well, you know, weaponizing this kind of software or what would be called cyber weapons is a threat we have to understand is far beyond what is simply compromising my phone. Yesterday, for instance, Kud and Coulomb's administrative computer was hacked. Now, the point is, in the case of Iran, as you know, the uranium uh, centrifuges were hacked. Now, this could have led to destruction of say, some of the centrifuges. It could have also been far more serious in terms of a public health issue it creates by dispersion of uh, uranium, uh, purified uranium in the atmosphere. So all those are threats, but the much bigger threat is, for instance, I use a cyber weapon and I blow up a nuclear reactor, okay, which is theoretically possible. It's like a nuclear bomb. So these are the kind of threats that come out with cyber weapons. Why does malware and cyber weapons differ? Malware in general is something you and I can sit in some uh, basement and try and create something which, which is a virus, which compromises computers, can uh, do various things, but they don't have the kind of scale or ability to penetrate really things or computers which are at the heart of various systems, which are physical systems. And those physical systems are controlling processes which can be extremely hazardous. So only nation states really have the ability to create this kind of malware, this class of malware, which poses a threat to grid and to physical equipment and therefore life and property. And these are all therefore equivalent to what are called kinetic weapons, which create physical damage. So therefore cyber weapons today are the same class of weapons as any other kinetic weapons. And therefore nation states not doing this would remove a huge risk from the world. Right. As I talked about earlier, such weapons do get into public domain. The fact that the entire CIA surveillance suit as well as weaponized uh, malware is out there, so is NSA's, all of it means we have just put the world at far more risk today. And this is why cyber weapons are sought to be repeatedly brought to public fora, international negotiations, there is a UN committee on that which has finally virtually given up work on that. This came up in the telecom conference called Wicket in Dubai, where all the global uh, countries had met for revising for purposes again of internet, how to revise the telecom uh, rules. Right. 
and laws which have been internationally agree, uh, agreed upon, the international treaty with regard to telecom. And the United States l led the abandoning of the wicket. Of course, a number of other countries signed it, but uh, the leading countries, the Western democracies, as it is called, walked out of it. And one of the reasons they walked out of it was trying to control how internet should be used by nation states and the fact they should not be used against each right. other. And that's what's really led to the rupture. Right. Thank you, Prabir. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click.